Hi, I'm Mylene Roach, founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. We're going to talk about what's on your design wall, what's on my design wall, and frankly, I'm still looking at another option for those dime doors on how we can turn that into a quilt if you so desire. So make sure you sign in and uh, let us know where you're watching from and, and make sure you know you sign your name in so I know who you are and where you're um, what you've been up to. And if there's something on your design wall, please put it in the comment. I'd love to know what you're working on. You know, improv quilt layouts is a process that is supposed to be very free, freeing, right? And it doesn't have rules. It has no patterns, no templates. It's a design as you go process. Hi everyone, nice to have you here. Let's see, we have uh, Miki in Southern California and Elaine Shaw is in San Diego and Sally up in Buffalo. Uh, it's wonderful to have everyone here from far away, right? So, um, and I guess it's hot up in some of those areas. I know it is here in Texas. I was looking at our weather report, 106 tomorrow, holy moly. The first person to sign in here is was, um, C. Lombard from Arizona. So I can't complain about the heat. She lives in Arizona, right? So we're gonna take a look at improv designing based on the design doors and then speed techniques for piecing a log cabin um, block. And then how I like to piece my batting scraps together because if you're like me and you do a lot of quilting with your embroidery machine, we always have to hoop more batting than we wind up using. So we tend to have a lot of scraps, right? When we trim those blocks, because often they have to fill that whole big hoop. So we wind up with a lot of scraps and I have you know, a great way that I've been doing and didn't invent it, I've seen it from other people, but we have a good product that I use to do that. So why don't we um, switch over to PowerPoint and we'll kind of get started. So I thought it would be best to take a look at, if you were to Google improv quilting, um, this is what you would find. You would see organic looking um, quilt blocks and, and finished quilts that you can see that the artist really did, you know, kind of work through the process. Denise Schmidt is a very famous quilter, fabric designer. She uh, embraces this. Jean Wells from Sisters, Oregon, she embraces this concept. So you'll see a lot of different uh, options out there. But you know what, before this kind of contemporary modern twist towards improv, crazy quilting has been around forever. And that was truly the original um, improv quilting, right? And back in those days, people used flower sack um, remnants. They used clothing, old blankets that had been in disrepair and just pieces of, you know, lots of scraps that they've embraced over the years. So several years ago, um, I wrote a book called, you know, crazy quilting with your embroidery machine. And uh, I was talked into that topic from my dear friend, Nancy Zeman. And we did record two shows on Sewing with Nancy. So if you want to take a look at that, you can just pop over to PBS Wisconsin and search Crazy Quilting and this will come up, those two shows. But there's a part one and part two. So we talk about, you know, how easy it is to... Um, you know, do that process with your embroidery machine. And we had an awful lot of fun, as you can see here. We are both um, looking just lovely, younger, right? And uh, of course, we miss, I miss Nancy for sure. So I thought you would just enjoy a couple of pictures of that. But anyway, so that's improv quilting for sure. But I want to take a look at the dime doors because last week, that's really what we did. We did some improv quilting when um, when we looked at the different layouts. So we had three across by four down, and we added some different binding colors to just take a look at it and uh, in different options. And then we went four across and three down in red and blue sashing. So different options there. And uh, the final way that we looked at it was with a horizontal layout. So six across and two down. 
And, um, you know, very traditional, you're going to wind up with a fairly small quilt, a wall hanging. Uh, I believe I gave you those sizes last week. And, uh, but, you know, they're only six by 10 inch blocks, so they're not going to be that large. So this past weekend, when I wasn't sleeping, because, you know, I'm, uh, I think an awful lot about embroidery when I can't sleep. So what I thought was, well, hey, what if we expanded that layout and put the doors in a, you know, uh, around a block, around a large center block. And this is my design wall at home. You can see it's just batting. And um, I placed the doors. And I, as you know, not all 12 are finished. So some of these are repeats of other months, you know, two Februarys. There's a couple uh, repeats of June and so forth. But now we have some options, right? We have a large hole in the center. So my very first thought was, well, let's add a large applique. And I went to my flower box quilt for that because there's some beautiful blocks uh, in there. And then I thought, well, I could really coordinate colors and so forth um, from, you know, embroidery designs that already exist. And it's a little big, right? Really big, overpowers the doors. So I thought, well, what if there was a border added? Would that improve the situation? I don't really think so because, you know, the doors are, there's so many tiny, uh, elements on each door that you these big flowers that are like four inches each you know totally overpower that look so even you know i flipped through all the blocks that are in that book and none of them would really work and of course i could design something else but you know i do like to use you know what's already done so i said well what is the heart of the home and what's the traditional quilt block that you would associate with a door or, you know, a, a quilt that features houses or homes. So I thought of a log cabin block because it just made sense. You know, it's the heart of the home, that dark uh, purple in the center of the block. So I had a jelly roll there and I said, well, I'm just going to piece a jelly roll um, log cabin block. And that turned out to be nine inches. And when you put it together, and you know, as you all know, there's so many ways that you can arrange those blocks, to, you know, for different variations. But again, those strips are two inches wide, right? Finished. So when we put that in the center of that block, uh, that really overpowers those doors. So I don't think that's really the way to go either. So then I thought, well, I could change colors, you know, or, or more subdued a contrast but then I thought well what if I just shrink down the block totally so I went to a five inch block and I did what I would call low volume prints and low volume contrast so my lights are very light on the top right side and on the lower left they are like a medium light so it's not as highly contrasting as the block on the right so it's going to be more subtle so when I put those blocks together I, nine blocks would fill that 20 inch space. Well, almost, it's gonna not quite fill it, but that's okay because it will be, um, I can add another border all the way around it. So those blocks do fill, I think they, you know, coordinate really nicely with the doors. Now, obviously I didn't pay a lot of attention to color, um, or the specific fabrics. I just selected a jelly roll that was in my stash. I didn't go out and actually buy a uh, specific fabric for this. So, uh, and I probably would do that, you know, really plan that accordingly. But how you can really make this all work is to um, use this, the same fabrics that are in the log cabin blocks as the sashing between the doors and then it's just all would blend really really nice and then cindy west she says um that you could put doors in the middle and the log cabin blocks on the outside you sure could but you know we have 12 doors and they're all rectangular you know six by ten so we're never going to get a square I kind of like squares, I guess, if I'm going to work with traditional uh, log cabin blocks. I don't, you know, I know there's other options, but um, that's just kind of my thought. So let's see, Vilma says she likes realistic log cabins and outhouses for his or hers to decorate bathrooms. So that's fun for sure. Um, but going back to the, um, the, the PowerPoint, you know, the, the, 
jelly roll strips, you can, you know, you can really make great use of that because to make the five inch block, you're just going to cut, subcut each strip to one and a half inches wide. And that remainder one inch strip is what you're going to use for your sashing. So I love that. I thought that was really great. So here's kind of a, you know, what's up next, right? These are the next steps that we have to take. I have to figure out what we would put in those large corner stones. Also, what color sashing would go around those log cabin um, blocks and then an outer border. But, you know, there would be several options to choose from because, you know, I most certainly have a lot of fabrics from the doors that I could incorporate into some of those different um, areas like the outer borders and, and the large cornerstones. Now, those cornerstones are 10 inch squares, so they're going to be a quarter of the size of the center. And we could put log cabin blocks there. Also, we could put four in each of those corners. That would be done. Um, um, I was also thinking maybe an applique tree would be nice, you know, and have it as a season, you know, kind of um, wintery for the winter and then spring, summer and fall, you know how that goes. Which really, when I was designing the doors way back in the beginning of the year, I was thinking more seasonality that I would actually have it, the same tree in every door and it would change with the seasons. But, um, you know, that's all, of, that's improv, right? It just completely changed, yeah. And see Lombard, she said, what about the seasons? She kind of likes that too. So another thought I had was maybe text, you know, uh, the words winter, spring, summer, and fall embroidered out where there's so many beautiful, um, so many beautiful text uh, options for us. And then Sharon, she's she, a medallion for a courtyard. Yeah, that's a lovely idea. I just think there's so many different options, so many different options. And Joanne Banco has joined us. She says, happy Thursday, everyone. You know, you can always find Joanne over at Let's Go So, And she's also a frequent guest on um on it's so easy. So I know there's lots going on in the brother world, right, Joanne, with all the new machines that are out. Boy, she must be exhaling now just for a minute because it was a very busy week last week for um, all everyone at Brother and Bernina and everybody. They all have new stuff. Let's see. So Vima says, how about a tree with flowers on the bottom colors according to the season? Yeah, I like that. Absolutely. That I'm definitely going to explore that. And Sandy, you like the text idea. Those things could be incorporated. Absolutely because if you see on the image on the right where we have the digital version of the of the quilt and that tan border that surrounds the uh, log cabin blocks is going you know would be a, wide enough to put text I think so anyway it's going to be fun you know it makes me want to start my doors all over again which <laughs> You know, there's a lot of work to do, but maybe we'll see. There's always hope. Hi, sister. Thanks for joining in, Marie. Okay, so I think it might be time to go take a look over at um, the speed piecing techniques that uh, I discovered for doing a log cabin block. And this is really great for, for people who are a little worried about... Um, Maybe, maybe you're new to piecing. So I most certainly did not do this in the hoop. This is pieced on a sewing machine. But the, the, how a log cabin is created is you start with the heart of the home, which is usually red or a deep purple, and then you piece in a spiral fashion. So here you can see my, I have my numbered pins, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So every once you start with your center, every time you add a fabric, you're actually gonna add two lights, two darks, two lights, and finish with two darks. So it can get a little confusing. You know, I always suggest making a sample block and, you know, numbering it, whether you have the pins or not, just, you know, with little tabs of paper, um, and so that you know what your process is. Okay, so once you have that done, you have your sample, then it's time to start the cornerstones. I mean the center. So here's my center, and then I want a piece um, a same size in a light fabric to it. So instead of pre-cutting, I just pre-cut all of my centers. My, these are one and a half inches for that five inch block. 
And then I just piece them to one strip of fabric. And I do, I'll do all nine or eight because I already have my one sample done. So I'll do all eight and then I come back and I trim them and press them open. And then the next thing is to add the um, very next color. So now I have another light and I have my two pieced pieces that I have added to this strip and I just keep doing that. And I would go the whole length of the strip and then I come back, trim it, press it open. And we always press to the dark side. And then next, it's time to add the next block, which is just this piece here. So now I'm moving into my darks. Now, it may not seem very dark to you because I have that really dark center, but it is darker than my lights. And that's what's important. That's what's going to create that low contrast, low volume, um, dark and light of my block. So once I have that piece, now you can see here's my my three patch, right, piece to my long strip, and I just go on. And I think I have one more example of that here on the fifth piece of fabric. So now I've done one, two, three, four, in spiral fashion, and number five. And again, here is my, my dark strip, and now I'm just adding my pieces that have already been pieced. And this is a really great way, if you do it this way, you won't, you know, you won't make mistakes, make mistakes on adding the wrong strip at the wrong time. So the next thing we do is add our um, number six strip. Now, I don't, I don't have this step out for you because I think by now you get the, the gist of how you do that. But um, once that's added to the side, we then add it to the top. Here's um, fabric number seven. And then fabric number eight is right here on the side. So here you can see I've added two lights, two darks, two lights, and here's my first dark. And then I finish it with um, my next dark, which will complete my five inch blocks. Actually, and I love that. I mean, it's just so fast and easy. And there's no, you know, no mixing up all your little strips and not a lot of pre cutting, which I like because all that pre cutting gets to be really uh, tedious time. So, another tip that I wanted to share with you is um, batting. So, on when if you're like me, you have a lot of strips of batting that might be about this wide, they might even be narrower or, or bigger, you know. But you know, batting is expensive, and to throw this stuff away because you need a piece that's 12 inches square doesn't really cut it. So I like to piece it together with our product that is Fuse So Soft. It's a Trico knit interfacing that we often use to finish necklines. We also use it on the wrong, we don't use it on the wrong side of embroidery to protect, um, you know, jump um, tie-offs, but also to make it more comfortable next to the skin. It's great for children's wear, lots of different applications for it. So I just cut two inch strips and frankly I, I usually cut you know about 10 of these I just have a little stash of them now you have to feel the trico knit interfacing one side is very smooth and the other is a little bit rough and that's my glue side so what I do is I take my two pieces of batting that I'm going to um, piece together right now if I do that that's going to be a hard line down the middle break down my block. So I'm going to overlap them about an inch and a half, maybe two inches. There's no measuring. You don't need to do that. And then you just take a rotary cutter and you want to be able to see the edge of the bottom piece. So I can see it. I hope you can see it too. I think you can on that camera. And then we're just in a very gently curving manner. I'm going to just slice along this batting, the double layer. It does kind of want to push on you. That's okay. That's okay. And then I lift and remove this little piece and then lift this one and remove that. And that is trash unless you have another use for it. And I bet some of you do. And then I take my uh, Trico knit interface, my fuse so soft, and I place that wrong side, you know, rough side down, the glue side. And you can see where I'm like kind of finger pressing the batting edges to make sure they fit nice and snug together. And then when I uh, just run my iron off this over this, it only takes a second and it's all pieced as one. 
Now, you maybe can see this little line, but when it, this is behind fabric, you'll never see that tiny little gap there. So that's how I love to do that. It's my favorite thing to do with batting scraps because, wow, there's a lot of them, you know? So let's see. Um, and Ashley, you love the, hi, Ashley, how are you? She's in Puerto Rico. It's hurricane season there. So we're all, I'm always grateful to see Ashley pipe in, knowing she has power and internet. Let's see. Um, let's see. And you never use, uh, Sharon Crean, she never used the cutting and curve to just butt it together like it is. Well, you can do that. But boy, when you do that curve, super easy. And it really looks great. Really looks great. Um, and Sandy, you say there's a wonderful explanation on how to do a log cabin with quilt in a day. Yeah, Eleanor Burns, so talented. You can most certainly find her tutorials over at Quilt in a Day. And as she's just fabulous. Just love that. Mm -hmm. I, I've had the honor of meeting Eleanor several times, working with her at different uh, trade shows and so forth. So, yeah. Oh, Shirley Horn, you said you saw this piecing concept on Missouri Star Sewing yesterday. Well, how about that? Yeah, well, there's lots, uh, I think there's a lot of different ways to approach it. And you know, one way that I probably would approach the first two strips of the corner, uh, of the center stone of the log cabin and its mate, right, that light colored, is to cut long strips, each one and a half inches wide, seam that whole strip, and then sub cut that into uh, the one and a half by whatever size that would be then, so that I have those two kind of beginning of a checkerboard, I would probably do that. Yeah. So let's see. Um, and Julie, oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say, you know, I love what I do. I feel blessed to do what I do. And we've been at it for a, quite a while now, quite a while now. <laughs> let's see. Um, and Isabel, you think an embroidery designs figuring a garden uh, would be a good idea as a centerpiece? Yes, it, it sure could be. But I know that I'm personally not probably going to design a whole entire 20 inch block full of small enough details to make it uh, coordinate with the doors. But it would be a fun way to, um, you know, use embroidery designs from your, your stash that you have. You're just really going to have to be careful about the size of those designs. You have to make sure that they're not going to overpower your dime doors because that, that's really, you know, what people, um, we want to keep that to be the focal point. And Vilma, you said, how about a treehouse? Cute idea. And Evelyn Reeves at City Square Park for the center. That's a nice idea. That's a very nice idea. Yeah. Oh, and Sarah Jones, she just put in her first, her an order for her first dime hoop. Woo, woo, congratulations. You're going to love that. You're going to love that. Those dime hoops are fabulous. I have to say so myself. Absolutely. So um, let's see what else is going on. We do have, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, about birds nesting because yesterday, uh, I had the most disaster on my baby lock machine. In fact, it's not running right now. I, I about cried. It, it, you know, I had a bird's nest and, uh, I, but I had my bird's nest tool. So I was able to undo it, um, underneath the hoop, you know, slice it apart. That worked out just fine. But apparently the problem was not under the hoop. The, the real problem is up in the thread path. And um, so I'm going to kind of pray on it and <laughs> just wait and see. I had to exhale, you know, take a minute and close the, the sewing room door and just walk away from it. And uh, uh, thankfully, I have another embroidery machine to jump on. So that worked out. But anyway, it does happen. But those bird's nests, when they happen, they are really frustrating, right? And you never know. Um, when it's going to happen and you can find results like this. This is after you have you, if you have our bird's nest tool, which is just awesome. And you're able to slice the bobbin and needle thread that gets caught in the plate between the stabilizer, right? Between the bottom of the hoop. That's just a horrible situation. And you can't, you know, without totally popping everything out of the hoop, that's how, um, 
you know, the only other way to get to get out of that situation is to use the bird's nest tool. Because, I mean, I've had this happen. This is the underside of the plate. Underside of the plate is just horrible. Just horrible when it happens. And I document it. It helps me a little bit. You know, I might curse for a minute and I might have a piece of chocolate. And then I get out my camera and I take photos of it. You know, other people take photos of their children, their grandchildren, their dogs, their cats. I take photos of good embroidery and bad embroidery. <laughs> I have a pretty one dimensional life. But anyway, that is the solution to those problems. The bird's nest tool, isn't that a riot? So let's see, Joanne Banco, you're saying there's two new edge to edge designs in the Luminaire, the new Luminaire 2 and the Luminaire 1 upgrade that will fit the new giant hoop perfectly, the 10 by 16 and a half. That is an awesome hoop. Uh, you could, Joanne, you could wear that not as a belt you'd need suspenders that hoop is so big and you're so slim <laughs> anyway yeah sharon cream we do sell that tool it's called the bird's nest tool it's the best 29.99 dollars you'll spend in your embroidery room because it is uh, a lifesaver and i've often heard um people call the bird's nest tool an insurance policy because once you buy it you don't get a bird's nest tool anymore <laughs> i mean you don't get a bird's nest anymore but uh sherry you say nothing worse than a bird's nest tool right and um you haven't had a bird's nest tool isabel since you bought it see how about that and deborah jones now she's speaking from the heart she's heard more colorful ter colorful terms for bird's nest and truth be told, she, she offices right next to me. So if she hasn't heard it in her own studio, I know she's heard it from me, but that's okay. That's all right. We're friends, right? So let's see. So what else is next? We have um, so those thread quartets that I wanted to show you last week. I actually have some more colors of them that I didn't get to show. So we have the pretty in pink, which is so pretty. Those colors are just lovely. And you know, Deborah Jones helped me pick those colors. She did a beautiful job on selecting the palettes of grouping these four together that are just really nice. Talk about colorful terms, right? And purple passion. So if you're working on um, irises or Mardi Gras or, you know, our the rock star prints, quilts, that kind of thing. These purples are just beautiful. And of course, purple and gold, so beautiful over the holidays, right? So you might want to stash up on that. And speaking of holidays, the ravishing reds, you can't get enough reds. Um, it's They're just gorgeous and a great price on that. So jump over to the website. And then a little summery yellows. I love the names of these. Sunflower, Sunspot, Lemon Whip, Yellow Quartz. Yellow quartz. It's really fun. Let's see. Joanne Banco is, what is she saying? She's saying, your snap hoops have made a lot of machine owners complete the quill of their dreams. Oh, that's so, that really touches my heart. That's so sweet to hear. You know, I have to say, one of the most rewarding things I have done is to meet an embroiderer who has, um, finished her first quilt on her embroidery machine, whether that it, it's happened at a class that I helped teach or I actually taught or just someone who came up to me and expressed their experience, shared their experience. And, because I know that feeling when you, you know, when you pour your talent into piecing or embroidering a quilt and making that gorgeous quilt top, and now you want to finish it. You want to get that bind, that backing and batting all together and quilt it. You want to finish that whole process. And, you know, we feel so stifled if we can't do it, uh, you know, ourselves. So to use one of our monster hoops and maybe the weightless quilter and actually finish the whole thing is very, very rewarding. Absolutely. I love that. And, you know, the quilt, well, September is all about quilting, but we got to get there first. So right now we're, um, I'm gearing up for next week where we have a guest coming, Patricia Gates from Pearly Gates. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her beautiful work. She is all about mylar. Her 
embroidery designs absolutely sparkle and she doesn't use metallic thread so it's an interesting way to get those beautiful looks with mylar and i'm excited to have her here i've been familiar with her work for a very long time and this will actually be the first time we're going to have a good conversation and uh you'll get to ask her questions and you'll get to see her beautiful work so she'll be here with me next week at one o'clock and we're going to talk all things mylar all things uh embroidery thread we're also going to be doing some face embroidery so like she has really fun ballerinas and cowboys and so we're going to be focusing on how to get uh, semi-realistic you know looks with skin tone threads so that should really be fun and um yeah, Ashley Jones is saying that um, Pearly Gates have the best Mylar designs. They most certainly do. And uh, Joanne Banco, I'll bet you know Patricia. You can't wait to see her. Yeah. And Vicki Watson, you think her work, uh, you love her work. I, I don't blame you. I, it's really going to be fun. Really, really going to be fun. Yeah. So let's see. Um, you, you, there's a lot to learn about Mylar. Well, I'm hoping to learn from Patricia too. I mean, she has way more experience with Mylar than I do. She's been at it for a very long time and focuses on that product. So she knows it's in, ins and outs and her embroidery instructions and in her design collections are very well thought out. You won't make a mistake and you won't add the Mylar when you're not supposed to. And that's a really nice trick. So where do you see um, how she explains that process? And it's it's a winner for sure. We're gonna have a lot of fun. So next week, you have to join us at one o'clock. You have to bring all your Mylar questions. And I want you to think about um, what you'd like to ask Patricia. And, you know, let's, you know, make it a really great show because she's so talented and I, this will be a first to have her on here with, with me. So I'm super excited. And uh, Rita, you won't be able to make it. You'll watch it later on YouTube. Well, that's fine. I know many of you can't watch it at one o'clock on Thursdays. And, you know, a, a welcome to those of you who are watching the rebroadcast. So many people can't make it. It's a it's a work time, you know, in the middle of the afternoon and so forth for many people. But um will will be uh you know you can always watch the rebroadcast so thank you for joining me today and take advantage of that special on the bird's nest tool that's our special this week as you know you always hear it here first um the special you know gets blasted out tomorrow but you can get yours today and um sarah jones it just said she's saying hello to sue brown well i might as well spill the beans right now well sue Sue S. Brown from OML Embroidery is going to be my guest here on the 28th of August. So when I reveal the September door, uh, Sue Brown will be here. So she'll see it also for the first time. I'm not going to show her before, even though she'll, we'll be chatting prior to, but that'll be super fun, right, to have her here. So I know many of you just love Sue. So I can't wait to get to know her because I really don't know her and we'll have lots of questions for her, I'm sure. So thank you everyone for joining me and I look forward to seeing you next week at one o'clock.